Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming in here today. I see quite a bit of people in the waiting room. Uh, we weren't supposed to start for a little bit, but it looks like we have such a large crowd already that I'll go ahead with the education and the meeting. I'm just going to bring up my screen so that everybody can see. So right off the bat, I'm just going to get this going. A little bit of housekeeping before we end up starting, uh, just to make sure you keep your microphones muted. Any questions that you have, we can answer them all at the end. You can enter your questions right into the chat and I'd be more than happy to uh, answer them once we are sitting here at the end. We are looking at approximately an hour to get through all the education and then we'll open up for the last half hour in regards to any questions anyone may have. Post presentation, if even if we don't have time to answer all the questions or you do have questions outside of the chat that you want to ask, you have my email right here on the screen. It's jessica.dl at canadahouse.ca. So I'll keep that up there just for a moment so that everybody has access to that information. I'm just going to a little bit of introduction to myself. My name is Jessica Delzi. I'm the Director of Clinical Services here at Canada House Clinics um, located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I have been in the cannabis industry working as a nurse for the past four years. And a little bit of my background has been addictions and mental health. I've done palliative care from pediatric up to geriatric, and I've also done oncology and infectious disease control. So I come from a very dynamic background and I entered into the cannabis industry about four years ago with Canada House Clinics, uh, and I've been here ever since. So a little bit about Canada House Clinics and who we actually are. Uh, so our parent company is Canada House Wellness Group. Uh, and Canada House Clinics is just the clinic portion of Canada House Wellness Group. And in the clinics, that's where our nurses, that's where the practitioners, our physicians, this is where the magic happens in regards to care plans and developing medical cannabis care plans for patients. We then have a sister company called Abamedics. They are a Canadian licensed producer located in Pickering, Ontario, where they are growing and supplying the Canadian cannabis market with medical cannabis. And then we also have Canalysis Technologies. And Canalysis Technologies actually develops our EMR and actually helps us through research. So Canada House Wellness Group, it's very uniquely positioned. Even our clinic at Canada House Clinics is very uniquely positioned in the medical cannabis industry because we're not just a clinic. We also grow medical cannabis and supply medical cannabis to a patient base. But then we have Canalysis Technologies who has developed our EMR so that we can do research. Actually, just a couple months ago, I ended up completing our cancer program. If it wasn't for Canalysis Technology Program Development, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish. Uh, so we are able to get out a lot of information. Uh, and we've been funded in the past to perform research on medical cannabis. So we were formerly known as Marijuana for Trauma. You may have known us as that. We were founded in 2013 by two Canadian Forces veterans in our Mokta, New Brunswick. Uh, since then, we now have quite a bit more clinics. We're very dense and um, we're very common into the Atlantic provinces, but we did start to branch out in 2016 to the rest of the country. We were originally designed to assist veterans who were struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder and physical injuries from their time while they were in services. And we were kind of helping them with medical cannabis to get off of their pharmaceuticals and to help with the side effects of all the pharmaceuticals they were on. Now we work with both civilians and veterans across the country. We have 14 clinic locations. Uh, as I said, we're very, we're very common into the Atlantic provinces. Just in New Brunswick alone, we are located in Edmonton, Armacto, and Moncton. We have our Charlottetown office in PEI. We have Sydney, Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then also uh, Mount Pearl in Newfoundland. Since 2013, we have seen over 15,000 patients come through our doors. Right now, we have about 6,000 active patients. And although this screen ends up saying 2,800 plus veterans, we are probably close to about 3,000 veterans at, active veterans at this point in time. So we're very veteran dominated. Now, I always really like showing this slide before we really get into the cannabis education because this is what's so interesting. Um, from 2013 to 2018, we ended up pulling all of our veteran patient files. So there was close to about 8,000 files that we ended up going through. And I was a part of that team where we went through these files to see, okay, yes, we're having symptom control, but there's more to this to, um, than just symptom control. We need to see what medications we started at, where are we now? So out of those patients, almost 8,000 patients, 97% of those veteran patients were able to reduce the use of pharmaceuticals. Actually, the most common medications that I have seen decreased from 2013 to 2018 in that population group, 
we saw a lot of diabetic medication like metformin was decreased, sliding scale insulin, there was weight loss, blood pressure medications were discontinued. Uh, but there's a lot of other medications and actually 41% of those medications were opiates and patients completely halted opiate use from the care plans that we were developing for them in regards to medical cannabis. Um, so those are really high percentages. So what we are doing at Canada House Clinics is it's working and it's not just working in a patient verbal level, but we can actually see it with actual physical information, including the decrease of pharmaceuticals. So before we get into cannabis education, what I would love everybody to understand and what you should know is that medical cannabis, the plant is not a new medication. Actually, we are about to enter year 20 in July of this year. Uh, medical cannabis has actually been legal in Canada since 2001 in July. And we went into legalization in 2018. And since then, we've been able to actively participate in a lot more research, a lot more preclinical studies for different ailments and conditions are being released and then making their way further into cannabis. The preclinical studies that we have now, there's hundreds of studies going on and there's a growing evidence of efficacy of cannabis for symptom pain um, management. Now, studies do show that cannabis is less harmful than opiates and other drugs and has fewer interactions and contraindications, particularly for the elderly. And I really do feel I really do feel that um, I have personally witnessed this for myself. I came from palliative pain and symptom management background where we utilize pharmaceuticals to help with pain and to get symptoms under control in end of life care. Um, and anytime I ended up, we introduced one medication, two more medications came along with that. And I've never seen that with cannabis. If anything, we enter into cannabis and we're coming off or we're weaning off pharmaceuticals. So it's a very interesting, completely 180 uh, utilizing medical cannabis therapy for medication. We do know that cannabis is less addictive than opiates, alcohol, and nicotine. Now, I want to talk about this for a moment because when we mention addiction in this context, we're talking in regards to a physical addiction. I will never see a patient who is utilizing cannabis miss their dose and be in excruciating abdominal pain because of withdrawal of the medication. Now, I have seen psychological dependence. There is a very large group of patients I have worked with who have forgot to utilize their alternative therapies or their coping mechanisms other than just cannabis and feel that the only way they'll get symptom relief is if they have their cannabis. So I have definitely seen a psychological dependence more than I have ever seen a physical. Not all cannabis treatments are the same. Uh, actually, we it, this is where a lot of medical professionals end up really struggling as they exit out of the pharmaceutical industry and come into the medical cannabis industry is that it, there is no standardization with medical cannabis. Not all cannabis treatments are the same. What I'll utilize for the patient with osteoarthritis at the age of 67 is going to be different than what I'm going to utilize for osteoarthritis with the patient who's 72. So, and everything matters from the medication they're utilizing to what they do on a daily basis, physically and for work, whatever it may be cannabis when you utilize the cannabis plant it is very dynamic these are this is not a pharmaceutical that we are talking about today when you have a pharmaceutical they are designed to go from point a to point b when you come to plant medicine plant medicine is not designed that way plant medicine will make its way through the entire alphabet it will go from a to b to c to d until it reaches all the way to z and when it does reach down there it works on different aspects of your body completely different organs but in the end ends up giving you some form of sense control but it does work all across the body and last but not least, you need to understand medical cannabis is generally not covered for many conditions. Actually, the only population we really see cannabis easily covered for is our veteran population. If you know any veteran patients who have been injured on a physical or psychological level during their service, they may very well have an awarded claim. Medical cannabis coverage comes with an award claim. As for the civilian population, generally all your civilians are going to be paying for their cannabis out of pocket. There are only so many conditions and um, there are specific eligible criteria to utilize the coverage from your insurance companies. So why is cannabis working? 
it, we it's really begin it's really has started to get the spotlight in the last couple of years and why why is cannabis working and we can thank the endocannabinoid system for this it is still not being taught in school to nurses or physicians or practitioners it is still not in our textbooks but this is not a new system the endocannabinoid system was actually discovered in air in the late 80s to the early 90s they were actually testing um, THC on the human body and poor interactions that were actually coming from it and they actually found something in the body taking up THC. This is where we had discovered our very first uh, aspect of the endocannabinoid system. It's a very easy system to learn and to understand. There are two receptors in the endocannabinoid system. There is the CB1 receptor, which is here in red. You will see it's very, very dense in the, um, in the central nervous system. So very dense in the brain, going down your spinal cord, and then in your peripheral, it's very sparingly in your peripheral nervous system. Then you have CB2 receptors. Now, CB2 receptors are actually very sparingly in the central nervous system, but they are very predominant in immunoregulation and in your organs, such as the spleen, the gastrointestinal system, your uh, pancreas. So very different areas as to where these two receptors are. So CB1 and CB2. So there are two cannabinoids, two chemicals your body is actually supposed to be naturally producing. So let's focus on the first one, anatomide, AEA. Now, AEA, anatomide, binds to CB1 receptors in your central nervous system. When anatomide is being produced and the CB1 receptor is uptaking it and it's doing very well, it gives patients relief from pain, nausea, appetite, depression, among other ailments. Actually, they've recently started in some countries to actually utilize this as the biomarker for infertility. If you're low on anatomide, you are probably struggling with fertility. Now, CB2 receptors are found, like I said, mainly in the immune system with the heavy concentration in the spleen and gastrointestinal system. And the chemical your body should be naturally producing is arachnial donoglycerol, 2-AG. Now, this is really interesting because this chemical does not actually bind to the CB2 receptors like anatomide and CB1 do. Actually, arachnial donoglycerol will float around your neurons, the presynaptic um, cleft, all in there, and it, will, it actually helps regulate other neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine uptake. So when they... This chemical is being produced in adequate levels and it's going to the CB2 receptors and floating around them. You will see regulation in emotion, depression, anxiety, and inflammation. So let's focus about the diabetic population for a moment here. And how does the endocannabinoid system really play a role in your diabetic patient? It actually ends up playing a role in the regulation of body weight, food intake, development of hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and hyperlipidemia. And I'd like to stop here for a moment because you will easily find this information. If you were to go and search for it and research, you'll find it. But there are, there are researching bodies that are bumping heads because we know this is happening. We just don't know the mechanisms as to actually how it's happening. All we know is that um, in the very first uh, cannabis to a diabetic research study that taken place in a Greek preclinical study, they were actually looking for the efficacy in THC to the CB1 receptor and what it has on the diabetic patient who was failing to, um, basically metformin was not working. They were failing on traditional pharmaceuticals. And they found in this, these populations that they were losing weight. The AC1 levels were balancing out the there was no more hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia. There was balance in the diabetic patient for the first time. Not only was um, it for the patients who were failing on traditional medication for type 2 diabetes, but they also introduced it in the exact same study. Uh, it was called Rio Diabetes. Is, I'm, we'll double check on that and can definitely supply that in regards to an email later on. But in that research, even the pharmaceutical naive patient who they hadn't introduced to any medications yet were showing the exact same responses. We all know how, why it's critical to manage blood glucose levels in the diabetic patient. If you don't, we could experience vision loss, kidney damage, limb amputations, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular complications. It's very important that we balance that. And most preclinical studies are showing increasing evidence that the endocannabinoid system, so CB1 receptors, CB2 receptors, 
anandamide, arachnial donoglycerol, when they work in synchronization, may help stabilize the blood sugars, preventing nerve inflammation, lowering the blood pressure over time, keeping the blood vessels open, and improving circulation. Now, we're not just going to focus on diabetes today because there are many conditions cannabis can help treat neurologically, pain, sleep, gastro, mental health. It's been used um, and studied clinically for many conditions. What is on my screen right now is what we have the most clinical and user evidence information for. And this very well could change two months from now. So in neurological, we have seen lots of support for epilepsy, MS, and Parkinson's. I'm starting to see more information on Alzheimer's. Pain and sleep, such as insomnia, arthritis, chronic pain, both neurological and musculoskeletal pain, fibromyalgia, for mental health, anxiety, depression, PTSD, stress, ADHD, and gastro is Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and appetite loss. The top five conditions that I see coming in through the doors of Kenneth has clinics across the country for both civilians and veterans across the different age groups, we see pain, chronic neuropathic pain or chronic musculoskeletal pain, depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and insomnia. Those are the top five conditions that we see on a regular basis come through the doors of Canada House Clinics. So before we really get into the cannabis plant and get to see its dynamic aspects and all the components and why you can't just randomly pick a strain and tell a patient to go ahead and take it in, it's going to work. There are things you need to understand in that plant as to why it's working. It's very complex. It's a multi-element plant. It takes more than just traditional research um, to be able to get us there. A lot of traditional research has isolated can cannabis compounds. Now, what does that mean? Uh, basically, the plant, the cannabis plant was placed in a lab where they researched the molecular structure of the top cannabinoids we knew the most about, THC and CBD. They recreated that cannabinoid, that molecular structure, and placed it into a pharmaceutical. Today, you would know these medications as Nabilon or Sesamet, another medication, Epidolex, that's a CBD, or there's the TVEX, which is CBD and THC. Uh, most research out there is testing isolated cannabis and is it not testing so much the plant, uh, there, but there are over 400 chemical entities in the cannabis plant that we are just not fully researching at this point in time. So some efficacy on cannabis is stronger for some conditions than others. The list on this screen, pain, sleep, epilepsy, spasticity, and alleviation of nausea and suppressed appetite during chemotherapy comes with the most. This is why a lot of insurance companies like Great West Life, Sun Life, many of these insurance companies are covering medical cannabis for these conditions when traditional pharmaceuticals have failed. So who should and should not be utilizing medical cannabis? It's like any other medication. It's not suitable for everyone. It comes with risks. Absolute contraindications as to when you really should be questioning if you should be prescribing this patient. If your patient has any themselves mental conditions such as schizophrenia and psychosis or a family history, um, the THC has brought psychosis out of this population or has pushed patients into schizophrenia. So even if it was a CBD only care plan, you have to be very, very cautious. At cannabis clinics, we just don't prescribe to schizophrenia or psychosis any cannabinoid because even CBD has THC present. It is normal and regular of the cannabis plant to have a small percentage of THC. Pregnant and breastfeeding women, we are currently not prescribing to this population. Any supporting documentation out there does show that the cannabinoids do make their way over to the infant. Actually, pregnant women and breastfeeding women were having very healthy pregnancies all the way through. It was actually when these children made their way into adolescence that that's when they started to notice the learning deficits. So much more research is required for this population and until we have it. We do highly suggest to not prescribe until everything is completed. Under the age of 25, the brain is still developing until the age of 25, the gray matter in uh, the adolescent brain. Now, we do make a case-by-case -case basis at Canada House Clinics. We have prescribed under the age of 25, but you do have to meet specific criteria for that prescription. You had to have gone through the traditional pharmaceuticals with your physician, and you need to be referred by your physician to be a patient under the age of 25. 
And last but not least, severe liver disease. Uh, our patients who come in with liver disease, we ask for a liver function test, uh, the most recent one. And the reason why is all oral consumption of medical cannabis or cannabis on a recreational standpoint requires your liver enzymes, the main one being your P450 enzyme. If those enzymes are not present to metabolize oral consumption of cannabis, it's not going to be effective at all. We're just gonna be throwing these cannabinoids into high blood plasma levels, and we don't know what the response is going to be. Potentials, men planning on starting a family. Uh, actually, Harvard a couple of years ago ended up doing research in regards to the use of cannabis in men who were trying to start a family. Uh, basically, it was believed that it was lowering sperm count and creating defective sperm count, but Harvard in a preclinical study proved that theory wrong. And as I said earlier, we are now seeing a lot more countries turning to actually looking at the anatomide levels to determine fertility aspects. So we know the endocannabinoid system plays a role and if it's out of function and yet THC and CBD are going to help bring that into balance, it may not be a contraindication. So I do believe in two years to three years, maybe a little bit longer, that will not even be a question. It will be off the list. Previous substance abuse. This doesn't mean that a patient cannot have medical cannabis, but we need to watch for addictive behavior patterns. We just wanna make sure that we are doing this safely. There is much research out there in regards to utilizing CBD for uh, withdrawal symptoms from substance use. There are a couple of our clinics across the country where there are addictions clinics who refer their patients while they're going through the withdrawal programs to utilize CBD therapy with the care plan we have made to help them through the withdrawal. Um, and it's been very, very successful. And last but not least, severe cardiovascular deficiency, especially in acute illness. So cardiovascular deficiency, we're talking recent TIA, MI, uh, maybe we have hypertension, uncontrolled, um, blood pressure, maybe we have issues with bleeding and platelet count. It's not that you can't have cannabis, but we do need to know that information because it's going to change your care plan and we very well could have some restrictions in there for your patient. So here comes the fun part where now you know some of the risks who suited for medical cannabis, here's the education about cannabis. So there are different plant types. As a consumer, you may have already made your way into the recreational market or into the medical market, and you are basing your decision of what you want on a sativa, an indica, or a hybrid. If this is how you are doing that, you may already be setting yourself up for potential failure. It is considered at this point in time an old school practice to go by the plant type for the effect you want, because we now know there are so many other components that are actually influencing that outcome that it should be a consideration, but should not be your final determinant. So let's talk about what you will see on this market. So sativa plants, I always tell patients, think of the S, think of the sun. Sativa plants were generally always utilized during the daytime. They're meant to be uplifting, energizing, provide mental clarity um, and, and creativity. It's a lot of cerebral effects. Indica plants, the next plant you see over here, an easy way to remember it, indica, think of indica couch. It's meant to be body sedating and mind sedating. It's meant to relax you. Um, actually, indica plants, we utilize a lot during um, high anxiety or high panic or high pain when our patients are sitting there with high blood pressure, high pulse, they're, they're very hyperactive. Indica helps bring them back to what I call reality, back to where they feel a normal again. And then we have hybrids, which are a crossbreed. It's a blend of a sativa plant that was bred with an indica plant, and now we have a hybrid. And they do come in different percentages. You can get a 60% sativa, that's 40% indica, 50% sativa, 50% indica, 30% to 70%. There's percentages everywhere. But here's what it comes down to. In Canada, in North America, every product out there is a hybrid. Even if you see sativa, it should really say sativa dominant. If you see indica, it should say indica dominant. Because here in North America, there's been so much manipulation, so much genetic breeding taking place that it's nearly impossible to find a pure sativa plant or even a pure indica plant. Um, you may have noticed now that you know this information a little bit more, if you've ever gone into the store and picked up an indica because it's supposed to put you to sleep, but maybe it didn't put you to sleep. 
because there are other components in there that may be overpowering the plant type. And we're going to learn about them in the near future. Now, cannabis ruderalis, you will not, we don't utilize that in what we're discussing today. That's generally your hemp where it's very low percentage of THC, generally a 0.3% THC and below with very high CBD properties. So it, back when I would have first started four years ago, that's actually how we picked care plans. We knew THC, we knew CBD. We didn't know about other chemical components. I would just say, Kate, you need something for the day. I'm going to give you a sati. We're going to go to a sativa that has THC, CBD. And then patients were reporting, well, I'm not, I'm sleeping when I should be awake or I'm awake when I should be sleeping. And the reality of it is cannabis is far more complicated than just a plant type. The chemical profile is actually much more important than the strain of plant from which it originated. Uh, the effect of a cannabis strain, you can be predetermined by looking at the percentage of cannabinoids, what cannabinoids are present, and the terpenes and the percentage of terpenes and what's present. There are over a hundred different cannabinoids that we know of to date. And this slide says a hundred different terpenes found in the cannabis plant, but we now know there's potentially even 200. So that's how fast this industry goes. It's the two top cannabinoids that we do know about are THC and CBD. Now, THC is very, very similar to the molecular structure of anatomide. Remember, anatomide is that neurotransmitter that your body produces that binds to the CB1 receptor in the central nervous system. So THC is very similar to it. If you are lacking anatomide, you will know because you should have issues with sleep. You should have issues with appetite, nausea, anxiety, depression, nerve pain, and so forth. If you take THC and it binds to the CB1 receptors, then we can see balance again. Now, CBD, CBD is very similar to the chemical structure of arachnial donoglycerol. Remember, that is the chemical compound. It doesn't bind to the CBG receptor. Instead, it regulates other neurotransmitters on that receptor. It just floats on the outside. So it prevents the breakdown. And when it does end up taking, when it's in good sufficient amounts, you will see balance in anxiety, balance in depression, inflammation. And now we're starting to see a lot of a effect on the addiction aspect of opiates and substance use. We're still trying to find out how that's really working, but it, we are now knowing CBD is playing a big role in right, that regulation. Keep in mind, there are, like I said, hundreds of others cannabinoids um, and the diabetic population in the near future, I think you are going to hear about THCV as in Victor, CBDA and THCA. They're already going into preclinical studies on type two and type one diabetes from peripheral neuropathy to balancing weight to balancing glycemic index with these cannabinoids. So terpenes, I absolutely love discussing terpenes whenever I educate. There are over hundred terpenes in cannabis. And I just said on the previous slide that we could even put that up to 200 now. Everyone is familiar with terpenes. Um, you might not know the word, but you are familiar with what they are. They are found throughout nature. Uh, they are found in food. They're found in spices. They're found in plants. They give the flavor and smell of cannabis. If you've ever smelled a cannabis plant and wondered why one smells like skunk, but this one over here smells very floral, you can thank your terpene content for that. And terpenes can actually increase or decrease the effects of cannabinoids. Um, there is a specific terpene we're going to learn about that actually can heighten the high of your THC. There's also a terpene that can actually lower the potency of your THC. So if you are a patient and you are going into the store and you're asking for the highest THC, but you are not looking at your terpene content, there are patients who are specifically looking for a high and may never get it because the terpene content is preventing that from happening. These, the cannabinoids and the terpenes and the plant type, these three things work together and it's known as the entourage effect. When you have a pharmaceutical version of cannabis, whether it's Nabilon, Sesamet, Epidolex, you don't have an entourage effect. You don't have the terpenes. You don't have the other cannabinoids. You don't have the plant type. What is actually in the pharmaceutical is maybe THC, molecular structure of THC, that's it with a bunch of additives. 
in uh, epidolix of CBD. It's just the molecular aspect of CBD with additives. So that is how the pharmaceutical and the cannabis plant differ from so much. They will provide you with two completely different outcomes. So CBD, um, let's just talk a little bit more about that in regards to diabetes. Uh, it may actually, we're starting to find it might reduce the occurrence and delay onset of disease for type 2 diabetes. There are a couple of preclinical studies who are demonstrating that. Once again, we don't know the actual mechanism. That is what's going into further research, but it may help reduce insulin resistance. Um, and I wanted to stop here for a moment because uh, just myself being a nurse, I have worked with thousands of patients across this country who are diabetes type 2, um, more than type 1. I'm sure you are all familiar with probably seeing type two more than you do type one. And we go into CBD therapy. And the number one piece of information and education that I supply these patients is that while we go into CBD therapy, as we are introducing it, and as we increase it, I'm going to need you to test your blood sugars. If you weren't doing it before, you're going to need to do it now because CBD, we know, balances glycemic index. Glycemic index to the normal population our blood sugars go down. There's a trigger in our brain that says, hey, we need to eat. We eat, blood sugars go up, insulin kicks in, it brings us back down and we keep going up and down. But when you take CBD, it actually just balances you along the line until it starts depleting out of your system and then your blood sugars start going down. So very important, I tell patients, we need to monitor this, especially if you are on metformin or sliding scale insulin, or you are taking just standard insulin on the regular basis, you need to monitor it because we do not want to put you into hypoglycemia. Another thing we tell this population, because CBD balancing the glycemic index, we notice many patients will report appetite loss. They have no appetite while CBD is in their system. We remind them you need to eat every two hours. Even if you are not hungry, you need to do it. Because once again, if you have nothing in your body to break down that blood sugar content and CBD wears off, you are going to end up in hypoglycemia. So two very important pieces of information for the diabetic population with dosing with CBD. Now, THC, um, it also has been shown to interfere with the action of insulin and its release. Um, actually, it ends up working quite a bit. My understanding was on the pancreas um, and being able to release the hormones. It does play a very large role in hormone release. It may also suppress the autoimmune response reducing the amount of insulin needed. Actually, patients in that study I was talking about earlier, they were testing THC on the CB1 receptors. They didn't even, some of them didn't even need insulin during their treatment. So as you can see, um, th this is what generally the population does to guide themselves in the cannabis industry. They look for indica, sativa hybrid. They look for THC and CBD in the percentages. Those are the broad generalizations that help the average consumer. But on the medical standpoint, when it comes to our educators at Canada has clinics, on the medical side, there is a lot more information that we actually have access to. We can go in and we can see what is called the terpene content of the plant. Uh, every licensed producer that is supplying this country with legal cannabis has to provide a sample of their product for um, analysis. And these lab reports will show us what are the top cannabinoids. We'll see the potency of THC and CBD and things like THC, A, CBD, A, and so forth. But a lot of them will also show us the top 12 terpenes in that particular strain that we're testing. And terpenes are very important because they can make and break the type of cannabis plant you have and they can make and break your THC. So just to give you an example, the top five terpenes that you um, that are out there and we know the most about, the first one being myrcene. Myrcene is actually found in hops. It's very earthy and mossy in smell. It's very sedative. Uh, actually myrcene when taken with THC can actually make the high of the THC stronger. You may have heard in the past, uh, there are myths out there that if you eat mangoes with your cannabis, the THC high is a lot stronger. It's actually, it is a myth, but it's also not a myth. What actually you are doing in mangoes, the common terpene is myrcene, which is very sedative. And when you take it with terp myrcene and THC, you can heighten the THC's effects um, as long as myrcene is present in that cannabis strain. 
The second terpene, cariol filing, you can actually find this terpene in black pepper as a very smice, uh, spicy smell and flavor to it. It is a very strong anti-inflammatory, but also it's very strong um, for anti-anxiety properties. Now we are in a part, we are at a point in cannabis research where we're actually questioning karyophylline. Is it a terpene or is it actually a cannabinoid? Because a couple of years ago, they actually started to see karyophylline being sucked up by the CB1 receptors, the exact same receptors that take in THC. And what is the effects of that? There are some cerebral effects to that. There could be a potential high. There is one licensed producer, and I will not put their name out there um, as we speak, but they ended up changing their formulation of their CBD oil a couple of years ago. It was the summer of 2018. Out of nowhere, I think in one month, we had five patients report that they were feeling high on their CBD oil. They lost peripheral vision. They felt drunk. They did, they did not like the experience. And that's when we went to their oils and we found that 100% of that oil was karyophylline and it never used to be. So obviously it is playing some kind of effect and we need to take caution with it, but in regards to pain, it is excellent. Now, Lionel is a terpene found in and lavender. And if you think of lavender, it's anti-stress, anti-anxiety. It's to help you relax. It's to help you sleep. So that is when you see Lionel in a cannabis plant, it's very floral in smell. Actually, some patients don't like smoking those strains or vaping them because they are, they taste very perfumey. Now, pinene, this is a personal favorite terpene of myself. Pinene, uh, you may have heard of patients being told to go forest bathe, go walk in the forest. They can think better. There's mental clarity. Depression goes down. Anxiety goes down. They can breathe better. It's great on the lungs. It's a bronchiodilator. Well, piney is found in cannabis in fairly strong amounts. Uh, so if you have strains high in pining, you can have those effects, but pining also helps counteract the short-term memory loss that THC gives you. So any strains high in pining, they're great for your daytime. It also helps with creativity. Now, humulene, this is starting to be a terpene that I hear talked about a lot more recently. Humulene has a very earthy smell as well, very similar to myrcene. But humulene in research has actually, um, it, it's an appetite suppressant. So if you are hungry and you want to stop your appetite, you can actually utilize a strain with humulene and your appetite is gone. So your diabetic patients, we have to be cautious about that. If we, we need you to eat, we need you to maintain those blood sugars. So we just have to be cautious of providing them that terpene. It's also um, why it's being recognized and talked about a lot lately is it's starting to demonstrate anti-neoplastic properties. So anti-cancer, it's killing cancer cells, not all cancer cells, but some. And now we need a little bit more information on it. And last but not least, limonene. It, which is very citrusy. You can find limonene terpene in any citrus fruit. Now, if you think about citrus fruit aromatherapy and what that provides you, it's antidepressant, anti-anxiety, antifungal, antibacterial, um, mood lifting, mental clarity, energy, energizing. And so when you find a strain that has limonene, you should experience those properties from that plant. These are the most understood terpenes. If you are looking for more information, I highly suggest to go to our website, CanadaHouseClinics.ca. We post um, lots of educational blog posts and videos onto our website. It's very easy to navigate. And we're actually doing every single month, we're highlighting a new terpene and just have everything you need to know about it on a therapeutic level with your medical cannabis therapy. So consuming cannabis, this is where a lot of confusion starts to happen. What do I take? There are so many options out there. There's dried cannabis, there's concentrates, you can vape, you can smoke. There is oil, there's capsules, there's brownies, there's gummies, there's beverages, you name it, it is now out there. So let's just talk about how to properly dose with it as a medical perspective. Um, when we have a pain patient in general, let's not even think about medical cannabis right now. If we have a pain patient walk in the door, generally pain patients all come in with the same kind of care plan. There's a long acting medication that this patient's going to be taking either twice a day to sometimes four times a day. They take that medication to control their pain. And if they break through, there is usually a medication that is there for breakthrough. It's meant to be fast acting and short lived, but just to help with that breakthrough pain until another dose of the regular medication kicks in. Cannabis is the exact same way. We do that the exact same way. 
You are going to be having a long acting medication that you take every day on a regular schedule to prevent these symptoms from breaking through. And when they do break through, we have a short acting medication readily available for you to get it into you quickly and to get the symptom under control. So what is the long acting? What is the short acting? The long acting, anything you ingest. So that's oil, capsules, brownies, gummies, I know I say beverages, but any beverage I have come across or experienced, and many professionals in the medical industry will tell you that this is just not the industry for beverages, the medical. Um, and even honestly, your edibles like gummies and brownies, we only recommend those when the oils and the capsules were not an option. So when you ingest cannabis, it's like any other medication. It's going to take an hour to two hours for it to take effect. And when it does take effect, it should be lasting you six to eight hours. If it's not lasting you six to eight hours, then you're probably not at a dose high enough for you, but you still got to start low and titrate up to that dose. That, that helps us determine that we need to do an increase. So that's how it should work. And then if a patient breaks through pain, then we have a short acting, which is smoking dried flour, or you're going to vaporize. Now there's two different vaporizing options now, thanks to cannabis 2.0. You can vaporize dried flour, or you can vaporize what is called a concentrate. And what's the difference between the two? Now, the dried flour utilizes a vaporizer. There's tabletops and there's handhelds. You break up your dried flour. Instead of rolling it into a joint, you break it up and you actually put it in this electric device. You turn it on and you can set your temperature um, to whatever temperature you would like, and then you inhale. There's no smoke, there's barely any smell, um, very discreet and much easier on the lungs. It's a lot less harsh. Uh, things to know about vaporizing dry flour. Uh, we talked about terpenes on the previous slide. Those terpenes in cannabis actually have what are called boiling temperatures. Once you go past that temperature, it's gone. You don't get it. Um, so vaporizing, that's another point of vaporizing is that you can actually get more medicinal properties of the cannabis plant with vaping more than smoking because the temperature of smoking, that temperature is actually too high for many of the terpenes that are present in the plant. Um, when I had done research on it, I think they said up to 80% of the medicinal properties of the cannabis plant burnt off when you smoke. Um, medically, we do not recommend smoking but we know patients do it. We just, we provide this kind of education to the patient so that they can make an educated decision as to what options are out there, why you don't do A and why you do B. Now you can also vaporize concentrates. And what is a concentrate? It is exactly as it sounds. It's a very concentrated percentage of cannabinoids from the cannabis plant. They extracted all the components out of the cannabis plant, got rid of the flower, and now we have this very potent THC or CBD that we can inhale through liquid. Um, it does serve a purpose. When you dry flour is great, but when patients are in high levels of pain or they are dosing on a regular basis to get symptom relief, then it may be time to consider a concentrate. It's meant to pack a punch to get things under control. May not be the best option for a cannabis naive patient trying it for the very first time. Now the concentrates in the vape pens are should not be mistaken with the ones that um, entered into the black market just before legalization of vape pens. Some of you may have heard all over the news, there was those young adults who were ending up in the emergency with popcorn lung because they were vaping. Well, there are regulations in Canada. We are regulated in the cannabis industry by Health Canada. There are things we can and we cannot do. And we actually, out of all the countries, have the strictest quality standards for our products here. That the, the, these concentrates in the vape pens on this market should not be compared to what you would have heard in the news. These vape pens were not even legal at that point in time, which led everybody to believe they were receiving it from the black market. And when they make them in the black market, they are generally making them with things like butane and ethanol, very unhealthy things are in those products. And that very well, along with other things, and I think they said vitamin E was what put them there. These are not the same and do not compare them. They really do serve a purpose. Now topicals. Um, topicals are just starting to come out and they serve a great purpose. They are not meant for deep tissue. They are meant for joint pain or maybe some muscle discomfort. 
Uh, you only need a small amount. What's great about topicals is it gives patients who maybe work for a company where they are doing urine tests for THC, they're testing for cannabis in the urine, um, and maybe traditional pharmaceuticals aren't working, this is a great option. Topicals do not go into the bloodstream. They actually absorb into your body fat, and then you burn off your body fat um, doing physical activity whatever, any kind of weight loss program will burn off that fat, but that's where cannabis stores itself. Um, actually, we started to utilize topicals a lot recently for our patients who have restless leg syndrome. We are seeing a lot of success with cannabis um, CBD and THC combinations applying to the thighs before bed. Patients who are on any triptyline, pregabalin, all these medications to try and get those symptoms under control are doing very well on the topicals. More research is needed, but we know it is working. And last but not least, sublingual. I put this here so that you know this is an option because we, and even myself, just last week I had this question, um, asking for concentrated oil in syringes to put um, sublingually under their tongue. And what the name of that product is, is actually RSO oil, like a Rick Simpson oil. It does not exist in Canada right now. But I could go to the States and I can go to a dispensary and obtain that product. It's not legal here yet. I put it here so you understand it exists. It does serve a medical purpose. Uh, and I definitely um, support the use for different ailments. It is a strong potency. You only need a little amount. It kicks in much faster and it lasts just equivalent to your edibles. Uh, so as I said before, smoking is the least recommended. We know patients are going to do this anyways. We know that. Uh, actually how cannabis, medical cannabis plant medicine works is we provide a cannabis prescription. We give you recommendations, but actually you're not restricted to what you can actually go get. Uh, you can order anything from your licensed producer as long as you don't have a THC restriction. We can restrict how much THC you get, but we can't restrict what kind of product you're getting. Um, so they are still going to smoke. The best we can do is provide education. Vaporizing is a much healthier option than smoking cannabis. Um, same time of onset. It lasts the same amount, but it is, uh, has a lot less carcinogenics, a lot less tar being placed into your lungs. Um, and it is a lot less harsh on inhalation. So we know all these options, but how do you actually administer cannabis? Believe it or not, I wish there was a golden number to give every single person as to where we're going to start, but cannabis therapy, it's all highly individualized to the actual person. Their previous use and how much they were taking is going to change how much we are going to be recommending. Uh, generally, we tell every patient you are going to be, you should be starting on oral consumption, an oil or a capsule of some sort. You should start on that. We should get your symptoms under control first and then start to play with product if you want to play with the product. We always start at the lowest dose on po uh, possible. Right now, uh, you will, most patients are being started on oil because the soft gel capsules uh, are one dose and one dose only and generally at a higher milligram. So we start low. We see how you are for a couple doses in a couple of days. If anything is unacceptable or undesirable, we stop. We stop the care plan and we may evaluate, maybe even switching at the strength. We, so that is how we do that. We start low, titrate up every couple of days. Um, patients, when it comes to pharmaceuticals, we usually have to take four to six weeks. You will not be doing that with cannabis. We will usually increase you up if you are reaching two full milliliters. So two full droppers and you have minimal symptom relief, we're switching out your oil. We got to switch you and start you at the beginning and go the way up again. When it comes to inhalation, we tell patients you wait a minimum of 10 to 20 minutes between one puff or one inhalation and see how you feel and then have another dose if the symptom control doesn't take control and you'll know next time. The number one error in the cannabis consumer, no matter what method of intake, is they took too much and it completely is a, it's an experience they never wanna feel again. You can feel paranoid, anxious, uh, your heart rate can go up. It is not a fun experience. It's very important we start low when we titrate up. Actually, if patients report that they're feeling high, that's telling me that we gave you a dose even too high for you. We have to go even lower. 
wait a minimum of two hours, but preferably four hours. Now, a lot of licensed producers will say wait two hours. We at Canada House Clinics recommend and prefer that you actually wait four because there's been many situations over the years where patients dosed, waited two hours, felt no effect, dosed again, but in 30 minutes, they actually did feel the first dose but then had that second dose and it was not a happy experience. So we actually say you wait four hours between bites um, or even ingestion just to really make sure the strength and the effects are accurate. Um, and once again, dose escalation can be done slowly over a period of days. It's not weeks like a lot of other medication. We're talking days. But if you are a high risk patient with cardiovascular issues, multiple medications, then we slowly titrate you up. Common adverse effects we see increased anxiety, reduced tear flow, decreased eye blink rate, bronchitis, that's from smoking, dizziness. We do get that from patients whose blood pressures are lowering. Um, so anyone who has any blood pressure concerns, it's best that they do monitor their blood pressure as they are introducing cannabis. Changes in visual perception, slow papillary response to light, reduced coordination, ataxia, cough, dysphoria. And last but not least, I think what's very important for you to understand hyperglycemia, but honestly, even hypoglycemia is a risk potential if you heavily use cannabis. Now, on this, I do have a document that I'm able to send out to everybody following this education session. It was actually supplied to me in the summer from a university who was doing research in regards to drug interactions with cannabis. And on this list, it's, it is color coded. Anything yellow means it's a mild interaction. Green, you're good, no concerns. And red is there is for sure a drug interaction. Um, now, I want to talk about drug interactions because just because you're on these medications doesn't mean you can't have cannabis. It's just that what we have to do is really manipulate the care plan so that you take your normal pharmaceuticals as normal and the cannabis will actually make its way around your care plan. So let's talk about these first and I'll go into some more details because this is the one thing I find consumers and many people in the cannabis industry don't know exists. So warfarin, any patients who are on warfarin, uh, if they are maybe going for blood work every two to three weeks, maybe once every three months, you're going to want to increase that to weekly. We know by fact that CBD and THC can increase those warfarin levels. So we need to really keep our eyes on the INRs. Uh, so you do have to monitor that. Now, alcohol, uh, it may increase THC levels. You may have heard in the news in the past, and I think this is why a lot of people have fear about cannabis and what it could potentially do to you. When you end up having um, any substance that is working on your central nervous system, and then you throw in more that's working on your central nervous system, you are always at risk for psychosis, too much excitement in the system. And in the news, um, there's been a lot of reports in the past at teenage parties, universities, colleges, where, um, you know, student ends up committing murder onto somebody else because of cannabis. Cannabis on its own, would not do that, but cannabis with another substance would potentially cause that because it would push that patient into psychosis. Um, so you have to take that risk. If a patient, uh, if you have a patient with high alcohol consumption, cannabis is going to be contraindication. We, um, we can give cannabis, but it's not going to be THC. We'll give you CBD to get that substance abuse under control. We'll evaluate THC in the future. Theo filing. This is the number one medication in COPD treatment. Smoked cannabis, when you smoke it, can actually decrease theophylline levels. Uh, but at the same time, we see a lot of patients when they do come in with lung disease, we are working in a care plan that's going to have pining in it to work as a bronchiodilator. But we do still need to be uh, mindful of any patient with COPD who's deciding to smoke cannabis that if they are on treatment for COPD, they've got to take caution with the medication. Now, clobazam, you could actually switch this now to benzodiazepines. So benzos, um, we have seen CBD increase some of those levels in patients and they experience increased anxiety, increased depression. Doesn't, once again, doesn't mean you can't have cannabis, but they have to take those pharmaceuticals as normal. It's the cannabis that we're probably going to be taking two hours after. Uh, central nervous system depressants, CNS depressants, a lot of sleeping medications um, kind of fall under this category. 
it does have additive CNS depressant effects with alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. So we have to be very careful with this population. We're educating them to say, you have to be careful with your THC. You are going to have to be careful with that as you're dosing with it. Um, dose low and see how you are before you're doing any increasing. The number one thing I have ever actually seen from CNS depressants, like I said, increased anxiety and depression, but increased nightmares. The moment I have a patient coming in telling me that they're having nightmares of cannabis use, we are looking for drug interaction. That's the first question we'll go and ask is, when are you taking your cannabis? When are you taking your pharmaceuticals? That's usually something we see with patients who are taking um, medications for sleep and are taking THC at night too. So why refer to a cannabis clinic? Why do cannabis clinics exist? Uh, as you know, just from doing this education, it's more than just THC and CBD. This is not like any other pharmaceutical out there. Without knowing about cannabis's components and when you should take it, what you should be taking and when, it could actually make things worse for your patient. And I've seen it. I've seen many patients come in and say, my doctor told me to go up the street and just go to the dispensary to pick up a product, uh, to have, go have CBD. And they come in and they've had a fall or their blood pressure is plummeting. They have increased anxiety. They're coming to us because they were told to go and get this product. And there's, it's not how we really should be doing this. We should be guiding them to something appropriate for that person. CBD, not everyone can have it. THC, not everybody can have it. There's hundreds of active ingredients. Now this slide says over 40 different strains. It's a much larger number than that. There are over, th there's hundreds of strains. And in a company like ours, our educators, our nurses, they are trained to know specific licensed producers. They need to know all their products. They need to go know how to go find that information to the patient that they just seen. So they can sit here and have a very high success rate for treat, helping the patient. This is why 97% of those 8,000 patients were able to come off of pharmaceuticals. Why 41% of them were able to halt opiate use. You don't go in blindsided, you personalize it to you and what you are looking for. So how do we help? Um, our patients will come in, they are referred to our clinic. They sit down with the nurse, a new patient will sit with the nurse for an hour. The nurse will go through all their conditions, all their medications, all their symptoms, their cardiovascular history, their family health history, their substance use history. Uh, they take all that information. They ask the patient, what are you looking to accomplish? Is it pain control? What's your pain now? Where do you want to be? They help them create a goal and they take that goal and say, okay, this is what cannabinoids you need. These are the terpenes we need to focus on for you. This is when you need to dose with it. And this is how you're going to dose with it. So that's how um, our clinic particularly works. Not all cannabis clinics work like that. Um, I, there's very few cannabis clinics where their nurses are actually sitting with the patient and doing that thorough health history background. So at cannabis clinics, if you are interested of not prescribing yourself, but putting that pressure onto someone who is specializing in cannabis, uh, you're more than welcome to refer them over to Canada House Clinics. The first thing is the patient obtains a referral from you. Um, our referral form can actually be found on our website. Uh, you fill it out and it, you can fax it right over to Canada House Clinics or provide it to your patient to bring to Canada House Clinics. We get the patient to register online or in office. I say online because thanks to COVID, our clinic has the ability to transfer between COVID closures and to keep open. Um, we can register online. We perform telemedicine appointments with the nurses online, the physicians online. Everything can be done online remotely. Um, or you can go into the office. We do have COVID protocols in place with how many patients can be in that facility at a time. So just to bear with us as we go through those restrictions. But um, we take that referral, we get them to register. Once they are registered, they are contacted to be booked with the nurse. And they attend that appointment with the nurse. And that's where they get all of their education um, very personalized to them, something similar to what you all would have received today, but it's personalized to them. Um, any going through their preliminary treatment plan, 
everything is done and then they go and see the physician. Sometimes we can do it back to back where they see the nurse and then go see the physician right after, but sometimes we don't always have that ability. So they see the nurse and maybe a day or two later, they're seeing the physician for the prescription. We get the prescription and we fax all the paperwork off to the licensed producers. And what is a licensed producer? You have to think of them like a pharmacy. They are licensed producers supply medical cannabis products to medical cannabis patients who are registered with them and you have a prescription with them. That prescription comes from us and we help with that registration. They will register that patient and then whenever that patient needs the product we recommended, they can call that licensed producer to place that order or they can go onto an online account, place the order, pay for it, and everything will be shipped to their house. They do not have to leave their house. Everything goes directly to their door. Uh, we do follow up with the patients about 10 days after the prescription has taken place. We make sure, were you registered? Were you able to order your product? Do you have questions? But not just that, we don't just do that follow-up. What's great about that educator, that nurse they would have seen, that is now their designated nurse. Anytime they have a question during working hours, eight to four, Monday to Friday, that is their nurse to contact and ask questions. Uh, if they need help with anything, or if maybe what they're experiencing isn't okay, the nurse is going to help them through that. And if the nurse can't help because it's too complex, it will go over to the practitioner or to the physician. So they get ongoing um, support throughout the entire process. So our, our staff, like where do we actually come from? Where are we getting our education? Uh, right now, a lot of research and learning comes from our patient base. Like I said at the beginning, we are very unique and we are very dynamic as a cannabis clinic. We've got our sister company, Canalysis, who developed our EMR that allows us to do research um, where we can put all this together and say, all right, this patient has cancer. We have these cannabinoids commonly used. This product is commonly used. This is the average dose. This is what we see coming out of it. it we are very, um, it makes us in a very dynamic position compared to any other clinic. But our staff, our nurses actually go through training and education through colleges and universities on medical cannabis application therapy from the cannabinoids right down to growing the plant. And the education continues to go on. We get a lot of education from physicians behind the scenes. So to sum everything up today, cannabis is generally well tolerated. Out of all the patients I've ever worked with, and we're going into the thousands at this point over the years, I maybe have come across one to two patients where I said cannabis therapy, uh, with the effects you're feeling, we should not be touching this. We should be leaving it alone. Um, the adverse effects are not that serious, but they are enough there that when we don't have supporting documentation to say, yes, the risk will, um, you know, the benefit to this is going to outweigh the risk. We just don't have that kind of supporting documentation. When the risk outweighs the benefit and we don't have the documentation to back us up, that's when we back out. Not back out, but we, there's caution taken with that. Uh, adverse changes in cognitive function and executive function, if that does happen, uh, it can happen with specific strains, but um, it can definitely happen with fetal or adolescent exposure. So you definitely want to take your younger patients who are under the age of 25 through the pharmaceuticals before you turn to cannabis. It is very well known that it does affect the gray matter on the brain and will later on potentially affect the executive and cognitive function of the patient. It should be avoided by pregnant women and nursing mothers until more research is out there. It should be avoided for those who have psychosis and schizophrenia or even those who are at risk. If you have a patient with family history, you should really rule out those conditions before you're touching cannabis. Um, driving impairment with cannabis. We do have to take that precaution just because patients have a prescription for medical cannabis. It doesn't give them any other benefit than um, someone who doesn't have a prescription utilizing cannabis. When you are driving and if you feel high and you are pulled over, THC is found in your saliva and you are coming off as impaired, you are going to suffer the exact same consequences if somebody was drinking alcohol and driving. It is considered impairment. Um, drug interactions, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, a lot of people don't know they exist. They are concerned for both THC and CBD, but it doesn't disqualify them from cannabis therapy. We just have to manipulate the cannabis therapy to work around their pharmaceutical. Um, 
I definitely thank everybody for attending today. I know it was a lot of information to take in. There was some discrepancies with the time there, so I do apologize um, in regards to that. We did get a lot of information out there. Any questions or concerns that you even have after today, I'm going to be putting my name in the chat and also we'll send it out in the email after. Any questions you have, feel free to reach out whether it's care plan related, cannabinoid related, if I don't know the answer, I can guide you to one of our specialists who may be able to answer it a little bit better for you. Um, we'll be sending in that email, the drug interactions, the, the slides, there's quite a bit of requests for the slides in this presentation. And um, I'm just hope that everything today was easily interpreted. And I hope that it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable prescribing to a patient. My own personal experience, uh, it took a lot for me to leave the industry I was working. I was doing palliative care to come into cannabis therapy at a time where it was still illegal. Um, a lot of people still did not believe in it as a medication. I was one of those people. But after three months of being in the cannabis industry and seeing patients, they would come in on day one and three months later, they're off all of their naproxen, they, their color, their skin tone, their smile, how they're standing and that they're back doing things that they hadn't done in 20 years. It was those situations where there was something to be hurt. There was something to be known about this medication. And the more that we're getting into it, the more information we have, the more comfortable I hope everyone is to prescribe it. The number one issue that we experience as a clinic from our patients is patients who actually come in behind their physician's back and ask questions because they are not comfortable to ask their physician. If you even have questions for yourself, this is what we're here for. On the screen, you see our website. That's where you can find our blogs and our videos. You have the email in there as well. And I will put my email into the chat.